good. All right, can you hear me here? Is this on? All right, thank you. All right, so we're going to talk a little bit about how we're using uh, MediaWiki at Genesis. We are the uh, information experience group, which is uh, basically customer facing technical documentation. And we've been using it as a not a not a traditional wiki, like a common source of knowledge sharing. It's really a, an authoring platform for our technical writers. So most of the contributors are you know, within our team. Um, we're starting to branch out to that a little bit where we're becoming more of like a, a service organization to some other groups in the company that have content needs. We can build uh, data structures and authoring workflows that fits the need of the content. So we're going to talk about two, uh, two implementations here. So this is a, a talk we gave last night that was an hour for us, like a pre-conference meetup, write the docs conference. Um, so we're going to try to go through it quickly. Is this not on? So I'm just going to do this. All right. So uh, I guess, I, hi guys, I'm Ed Jamer, I'm uh, one of the technical writers and I, I'm using this platform. And uh, for us, content wants to be free. We want our content to be free, but we don't want it to be quite this free. We, we, we realize that, you know, for us, uh, our content, to make it free, we need to find a way that we could reuse it. We, we need to find a way we could structure it, we needed to find a way that, you know, we could change uh, our ability to, to have users consume it, both internal users and external users in sharing it. Uh, for us, you know, it's really important. There are a lot of different levels of, of users and, and people who are working with our content. So we kind of, uh, you know, split that up into a couple of groups, builders, administrators, authors, consumers, uh, all the way down. They have different needs. And so for us, uh, you know, Enterprise Media Wiki really worked as a toolkit that would kind of resolve the needs of all of those different groups. And uh, I know people were talking about what extensions they found are useful. Um, you know, for us, when we, when we think about Inter Enterprise Media Wiki, we're using Cargo for, you know, slicing up our data, giving us a nice way to, you know, pick and choose what we're giving people. We're using page forms as a way to kind of, you know, hammer into our writers what they need to do when they're creating content. Uh, that, that's, you know, really good. Uh, obviously, for us, visual editors is, is really important as well because uh, we have a lot of people who are non-technical who are creating content. So if we don't have a good way for them to get that content into the wiki, uh, we, we end up having a lot of problems. But uh, two things that, that you know, I think, I don't know if they count as enterprise media wiki for most people, but are really crucial to us are uh, Tweaky. This, this uh, is a skinning, uh, really nice, really flexible, you know, based on Bootstrap, gives us a way that we can provide a lot of different views for our content. So our end users, you know, they are, uh, they're everything to us. You know, we are selling our documentation. You know, that's that's our goal. So we don't want to look like MediaWiki. We want to look like something that's like, customizable, that's going to give us a lot of options and a lot of flexibility in how we can present that. So this is really critical to us. And the other thing that's really critical is is Minty Docs, and. Um, Minty Docs is an extension that most people probably aren't using or probably haven't heard of. It's kind of uh, still very new and, and being developed by, by your own, actually, who's here at the conference. And uh, this is a replacement for us. This fits a lot of our needs as a technical documentation department, where it gives us the ability to do versioning and uh, some access control and some other features. But it really is what kind of um, brings things together for us and provides a lot of organization uh, for, for the content that we're working with. So. Um, yeah, you know, the, the key question for MediaWiki is, what are you going to do with it? Yeah, so something I heard somebody at another, like on a video from another enterprise MediaWiki convention, or maybe it was Semantic MediaWiki, but they used the bag of flour the metaphor. And when we're talking with other groups, trying to, you know, make connections between our content and their content, uh, it's a metaphor that seems to work when people are asking, what does it do? And it's, it's hard to answer because it can do, like, what do you want? From your content, you need to understand that, and then you build a solution to fit the content. And uh, I think it, it it helps to uh, it helps with communication to, for us, anyways. To use that metaphor, we have to uh, we have to build something or um, cook something, maybe. <laughs> anyways, so this is a layout of uh, uh, not everything that we're using MediaWiki for, but from a high level, some of our current uh, major projects. We're using Enterprise MediaWiki in the middle, and then, um, so we have two major case studies, two major projects right now that we want to focus on. So there's two sites that I guess we own these two content sites that are 
customer facing public technical documentation, then there's a Genesis use case portal. We'll talk more detail about what use cases are, but they're really kind of critical for the sales organization in our company to you know, sell our pretty complex software um, and how those two things work together. So these are authoring platforms, but they're also the, uh, the uh, you know, display platforms for um, our readers. But on the other side, there's other content silos, content, or other websites basically that we don't own, but integrating uh, with those sites, reading and writing from them using, uh, uh, well, uh, the Cargo API for pulling content into, uh, you know, sales has websites, professional services, they have their own web applications, they don't, they're not gonna move to MediaWiki you know, different silos, different organizations, di different budgets, different histories. The ability to have these websites talk to each other and share content through uh, REST API web services is uh, a very different model for technical documentation tools, which you probably don't know anything about, but it's not something that's common and it's getting a lot, we're starting to get a lot of traction within the company. It's, it's great for single source of truth. You can actually have multiple single sources of truth throughout the, throughout the company, but if, if these APIs can talk to one another, you can, uh, you know, you're not copying and pasting content. You pull it in at runtime on the fly by an API call. It's great. Um, that Minty Doc is in there as well, which, again, all the rest of the extensions that you're familiar with, they all feed into Minty Docs, which is, helps stitch together a, a nice presentation layer for, for readers. Um, this sort of lays out a little bit the content to the data approach. I mean, some of this is trying to... Uh, capture how this works for, for the technical writing, technical documentation community. This is not necessarily the most common way of understanding things, but you, you know, it's more, probably more understandable to folks in this room. All right. So I, I think for us, um, one thing that happened is we started working with MediaWiki and, and it was just a content authoring platform. We had a lot of like flat text and we had a lot of content that was just being put out there and published uh, and that, that wasn't super useful in the long term. It worked well, you know, in some capacity, but what we realized is that, you know, we had two different, we had two different case studies that, that recently brought into light, you know, how much better <coughs> life could be made for our writers and for our teams. Uh, the first is that we had our own in, internal documentation teams that are writing docs. These are being provided to customers. And we knew these requirements really well because this is our content that we own. Uh, and what we had was we had a lot of content, but we didn't have a lot of structure. We didn't know how to, to really push forward with that initially. But there was another uh, team, the, uh, the Genesis Use Cases team. And uh, they had a lot of really great data structure uh, available to them. And they had a lot of content as well. But they weren't using tools that really... Um, enforced the, the data structure. They were using a lot of processes to try to manage content in, in tools that really weren't suited for the job. And what we realized is that, you know, with these two case studies, um, we, we both could benefit from, you know, uh, understanding how well-defined data structure and content uh, and, and the proper kind of tool chain that we were, you know, learning from our own uh, experiences here, from our own, you know, projects where we were slowly starting to, to see the value of structured content. Um, if we could kind of merge those, they, they had a lot of similarities, and uh, the tools that we could use to to fix, you know, the deficiencies in both were kind of the same set of tools. So we're going to talk in, in more depth about these two case studies and how we move forward with that. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, the first one, our, our own Genesis Docs internal team. Um, we had a lot of content, and content would look kind of like this. And if you remember that, uh, you know, wonderful Shopkins card um, earlier on, you know, this at one point would just be flat content on a page, but when you look at it, you realize there's really a lot of content here that, that could and should be structured and that we can break out and we can, we can really define individual bits of data. So, you know, in our article definition, we, we are trying to move to an every page is page one philosophy, which some people have heard of and some people haven't. It just means that, you know, when you're coming to the wiki, every page needs to be really um, a standalone artifact that, that gives you a lot of uh, information about where you're coming from, what's related to it, where you need to go next. It also you know, needs to give you a, a kind of key uh, set of information when you, appear, when, you, when you drop in. So 
we talked about info boxes. This is our documentation version of an info box. Now this is a very basic one and we're working on expanding that. We'll talk about that later. But we also have these set, sets of structured content where we have you know, well-defined uh, types of, of information and articles that we want to provide information about, which may include links and images and other content. But it, we're treating it as an in, individual, these individual pieces come together to create one you know, data structure that we want to enforce on our writers. So uh, if we move forward, you'll see that you know, this is all pretty standard, I think, for most people using Enterprise Media Wiki. We wanted to clean that up. We, we put some forms in the background. We made it really clear so that now, instead of you know, having flat text or editing, we've got our own you know, set of headers that you, you edit. And the next page, you can see that there's also you know, uh, sections that you can, you can add one or more sections. You can reorder them instantly by just dragging and dropping. And you can really define all these bits of content that can be reused later. So for our writers, the interface was great. Uh, and it, it gave them a lot of flexibility. And for us, as you know, some of the designers and developers on the back end, you know, behind the scenes, all this queryable information was really valuable because we can now build different types of content whenever we need to. So, um, yeah, if we go to the next page, uh, do you want to talk about the vision for EPO headers a little bit more as an info box? Sure. <clears throat> so every page is page one is, uh, I don't know, I guess it's a philosophy of how to structure content for the web. I know Lex is a big fan of it. He's talked about that at other talks. Um, there's a lot to it, but in a nutshell, how we want to use it is we want to use our info box as uh, kind of every page is page one heart. One of the key things is that uh, users hit a page through uh, search or maybe a link. You've got to consider that the front page for all the content. So if it's the wrong, you want to establish the context for the page right away. So that statement at the at the top of the page describes what the page is about. People have to get a really quick sense of whether it's an appropriate page to be on. If it's not, you have to have links that take them to other layers of information. Typically, we're driving, we want to drive to uh, user role portal pages so they can find getting started content appropriate to their user role because the page is tagged that user role. There's also, we want to have links to the use cases, which uh, again, we'll talk about a little bit later, but the use cases provide kind of like a solution level summary of how the software works from a business case level at a high level. So we want, we want to use this header to drive traffic to the high value pages. We know from our analytics about people get to the content. They, you know, we have feedback mechanisms and half the time people don't know uh, the content is there. So like, I, can't, like, I, can't understand, I can't find out how to do X. It's there, they can't find it. The search doesn't work as they expect or whatever. So we wanna make sure we drive traffic to the pages that will uh, help them through their uh, user path. Just if you go back for one more second. Uh -huh. and I, I think the real beauty for us, of course, is that anyone who's worked in, our, in technical documentation, you know that <clears throat> content that used to be static, that's, that's a horrible maintenance effort, right? The, the, ability to dynamically generate all of this content and to, you know, this is one small piece of a page that's dynamically generated, but uh, with all of the content as data, it's not just this little piece that we generate, it's like uh, large sections and, and a lot of different ways that we can add our content and slice and dice it. And so this not only reduces, you know, the cost for us and maintenance and upkeep and, and trying to work through those problems, it just, it makes the, the whole, uh, experience for the user, for the writer, and, and for the, the designer much better after we've you know, kind of got those guidelines in place. So it, this is a really big for us. So uh, yeah, if we keep going forward, I guess. Right. <clears throat> I guess, I don't know, I'm going to continue a little bit more. <laughs> but it's sort of, uh, this is like all metadata, right? But there's also like the how to maintain that metadata. And in, in this, the way we have things structured, and with Minty Docs as well, there's, there's layers to it. So there's like a, a content area layer then a product area layer, a, a book layer, an article layer, and a section layer. So we have our metadata hierarchically set. So some things you can set at the content area level and it cascades down. Some things you set that way, an individual all the way down and you can have defaults and overrides and so on. But the idea there is we don't want, with some other systems, what writers do is they'll write a little chunk of content in a system, it takes them half an hour to write the, the, the piece of content, then they spend 25 minutes tagging it so that it works with others, uh, you know, 
other publishing systems. But this way, we limit that. We, have, we inherit as much metadata as possible. Some of it is maintained at an admin level, and some of it is given that uh, you know, writers can control that, and that various level of access control to how we manage the metadata is, uh, it makes the authoring experience a lot more usable, and it gives us a lot more control over the things we want as site architects to, you know, we want our content to look and act a certain way. So um, it's really flexible <laughs> and uh, hard to describe in 30 seconds. Right. So I'm going to take just a minute and I'm going to go back and talk about Minty Docs. I, I promised I would. Um, so, you know, in the, in the tech doc world, there's a lot of things <coughs> that we need to do. Um, key for us is, is versioning support and so we maintain different versions of the document and we make it available at, to customers at different times and so um, you know the, one of the things this provides is versioning support where you can define different versions you can define statuses about whether it's released or unreleased and, and what kind of accessibility you have you can actually do access control uh, based on you know user roles or, or user groups uh, and define who can contribute to view or, or access different types of content um, you know with the caveat that some security is uh, more on a business level than on a, you know, an actual technical level here. But um, content management tools, a lot of tools for our writers that enable them to copy individual pages from you know, one product space to another. We define product spaces and we define within those product spaces you know, the types of content that are going to be available. But for us this is really powerful because it allows us to, to take entire sets of data and you know, create copies of it in different locations. You know, move them. Uh, it provides a lot of support for dynamic linking to uh, reduce our, our overhead and our, our need to kind of go back and forth if we are, you know, copying content out to different areas uh, and creating different content sets of content based on the same information for, for versioning. You don't want to have to go back through and modify the content to indicate, you know, some of your links maybe are, are going to have to be redirected. So there's a lot of dynamic support there. And another nice thing that it does is it, it creates a table of contents for us where we can um, build you know, virtual manuals, collections of topics that, that have similarities. And this is just to kind of guide the user experience. So you know, this, uh, for us and, and within our industry, this is, you know, I, I don't know of a lot of other things that, that do this kind of support. Um, there was one from Splunk, there was one called PonyDocs, and this, this uh, Minty Docs is actually based on that functionality, but trying to clean up a lot of the code. Uh, and, you know, they developed it kind of organically for their own needs for documentation. So, um, yeah, this is, this is really important for us. If you want to know more, talk to us or talk to your own about it. It's, it's an interesting uh, extension. Uh, anyway, a docs code is a big thing. Automatic generation of content. I'm not going to dwell on this, but needless to say, you know, we want uh, whatever comments our developers are writing to, to come into our, our source code. And, you know, really nice to have a pipeline where we can bring that content in and we can really uh, immediately, if you want to skip forward, uh, we can uh, have that content brought into MediaWiki and brought in and very quickly turn into content that is structured. But uh, with Minty Docs as well, the nice thing about that is we have the structured content brought in and, and defined, but once it's in, we have the ability to uh, mix it in with our own content that we're defining. So we have, you know, Markdown, we have uh, Swagger output, uh, co content that is being generated and uh, then used, but we're able to, you know, uh, intersperse that with our own content in a variety of ways, both uh, at, at a table of contents level using Minty Docs or on the various pages that we're using, because once it's, you know, in structured content, you, you slice it mm -hmm. however you want. So. Yeah, let's keep going. And <clears throat> I'll just mention for Docs as Code has uh, it's pretty popular right now for developer documentation. Uh, so a lot of Docs at uh, you know Microsoft, Google, it's all Docs as Code. So it's uh, you know comments and source code that get published to static websites, which uh, it's pretty good. It's lightweight. It's actually quite similar to a wiki approach because it's markdown files, which is similar to wiki syntax. And oddly enough, when you hear companies that implement it, they implement it in order to uh, expand the number of authors in their organization. It's weird. So they're basically recreating wiki functionality using you know, markdown files stored in, in Git and, and use that version control. But typically, they're published to static websites, so there's no database in the mix. So when you talk to people who are actually you know, writers at uh, Google or whatever, who are working in this uh, kind of Docs Code environment, there's a lot of portal pages they have to like manually go. If there's a page that has a list of links to underlying topics, you got to like manually add those links, right? So there's a lot of overhead that. So we think that publishing into 
uh, the enterprise media ecosystem where you throw the database in it, you can structure as much as you want. It's pretty flexible. We'll see how it goes. And yeah, exactly. Just like he's saying, that's that's the goal. Docs is code turns into content as data. We don't we want our data to be uh, our content to be data. We don't want it to be those static pages. So mm -hmm. We flip forward a whole lot of reasons. We want to be able to reference in pop-ups. We want to be able to you know generate uh, entire documents. Like, pick and choose what information we want to generate FAQs or other types of doc documents. And we want automated portal pages where, you know, as soon as you generate, as soon as you run your, your docs as code and you, you run it through the pipeline, you get uh, new portal pages that are updated automatically showing you what you need to know. So, uh, yeah. Yeah. So a little bit, I think we talked a little bit about the use case project. Uh, right. So this is a, a, the offer management team that owns this content. It's written by product managers and professional services and subject matter experts not written by our technical writers directly. Um, and it, they had, there's about a hundred or so, every use case is got a structured template, about 50 fields. They had the data structure defined. They were trying to use, I don't know what, I think it was confluence in Word. They were trying to just impose structure using, here's the template that you should follow and then, you know, hoping that people would follow the rules and guidelines. And so it was a full-time job to track all that. Uh, to make sure things were, uh, were, were clean and solid and they actually weren't, right? Um, anyway, so we built the framework for them. It works pretty, it works pretty well. And with those 50 fields, they, uh, we can drive a lot of uh, um, alternate, yeah, so there's an example, the beginning of all the fields is very, is very structured, and some of these fields have uh, high business value, say. So I should, so this is just an example. So one field in uh, the, you know, the, the, the 50 in the use cases is the maturity level of a use case. So for the sales organization, the maturity level is very important. So they need um, <coughs> tables are really just output, I think, a single, a single field. Uh, with some of the, the solutions and so on. It was a point I, was tr I want to get to is that um, we don't know exactly what all the visualizations into the content are needed, but when they do want something like this, it takes two, three hours, say, to put together a, a bunch of books that are now we can publish. And in the old technical writing world, these would be written by hand. Somebody would have to spend two, three weeks building these books and manually adding all these. And that's the way it was done and still is for a lot of groups. And, not doing that grunt work labor and having headcount dedicated to this is important for our group. <laughs> yeah. um, here's another aspect. So this is talking about uh, the content as a web service or headless CMS is another metaphor. There's headless CMS companies out there that you know, all the content is stored in an uh, I don't, know, I don't know what the back end is, but you can query it via API, and Cargo can do that too. We can, you can, uh, the, the con so our, any content we have in Enterprise MediaWiki is now effectively turned into headless CMS that anyone else in the organization can then pull from dynamically. So this is an example of a new sales tool that they're working on called Seismic. They, you know, for a, a, a corporate sales-driven organization like us, like ours, uh, you know, beautiful sales material is, is very important and they have their own uh, procedures for building that. But this tool uh, is a, is a, allows you to create uh, their beautiful PowerPoint presentations, but they can set up a data source, which in this case is cargo, and pull in the fields that are needed live on the fly at runtime so we, have, we can enforce a single source of truth. A couple months ago, what they were doing is the marketing would come to the old single source of truth, which was just a web page that had the content. They would copy and paste into a PowerPoint, upload it to their tool. People were managing documents, not managing data, not managing the actual content. This is really interesting. So, and there's more of that kind of play in the, in the company that, uh, you know, web application, web application communication. It was also from an enterprise media wiki point of view, if, if you were able to create beautiful PowerPoints, and if there was an extension that allowed you to do this kind of thing in, uh, in an open source way, would be really good for enterprise media wiki adoption, I think, from in more of a sales driven organization like us, where you need beautiful outputs, right? And PowerPoint, a PowerPoint. Sure. Yeah, no. yeah. right. Um, it's, uh, 
It's the tool they love. <laughs> All right. So we only got a couple minutes. Um, I just want to say that you know this this slide initially was made for uh, a tech, for a writer audience instead of a technical audience. And so for uh, for them, the key takeaway we had was define your data structure because you can't get started until you know what you want your data to be. But since you guys, I feel like, are already data driven, uh, what I want to encourage you is spend some time thinking about your visualizations because that's how we sell. That's the tables, they don't care. But if we can show them an output, then we can get traction and we can get um, budgets maybe. I mean, that's, that's the goal. So I just want to throw that in before we throw questions. So that's, visualization is really important, both for, for us as our, our company and I think for Enterprise Media Wiki as a whole. Yeah, any questions? I have a question. Yeah. Um, so, with, so can you tell me a little bit about how you use Minty Docs, especially do you use the capability for having versioned documentation? I think I saw that in one of your slides about yeah. versioning. Yeah, and how, how does that work? Uh, you want to take it? OK. I, I'm just going to, I'm going to ask Maybe we could defer Minty Docs questions and you could track us down because I'm not going to be able to answer that in the amount of time that we have before the next presentation starts. But I think it's a great question. And I, I just want to stress that, you know, versioning, when we talk about it within Minty Docs and Tech Pubs, it's more that we need to maintain multiple versions of our documentation because we have those software uh, out in the field and users need to be able to refer back to different sets of documentation. So it's not just a history, it's a more. So you mentioned at the beginning that you're using Tweaky as a skin. Does that automatically give you a mobile-friendly view using that skin? Sorry, I couldn't. Does it give you what? Does it give you a mobile-friendly view automatically when you use that skin extension? Yeah, it is. It is mobile. It's, so it's based on Bootstrap, so it's mobile-friendly out of the box. We're getting a new design. So we have a UX person that's, build, that's building us a nice design for it. So in a couple of weeks, we'll have a nice new site up, but it's built on the Tweaky skin. Also, we build into the skin itself some cargo calls. It wouldn't be an API call, but it's just directly calling the SQL database. So some of the metadata that writers allowed in a page can change you know, the footers at the page. It can change some of the website architecture, not just in the content area, but in the skin itself, which is really interesting. So we can, we can build that into the, the doc structure in the application without changing the tweaky skin directly. Uh, and may, maybe it's also worth mentioning that uh, because we have, you know, two case studies here we showed.